Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast. We are post-evangelical ministers and theological thinkers grappling with our place in the progressive Christian world. Thank you for joining us for another conversation on faith and culture. This week, we have an interview for you brought to you by our very own Mona. She sits down with her friend Lauren, and they have a great conversation about religious identity. You'll notice that in the first minute or so, the, the audio quality is a little shaky on Lauren's end, but it picks up right away, and uh, the rest of the conversation is, is great quality as usual. And if you'd like to comment on the interview or the conversation that they had, you can do that at the show notes at irenacast.com slash 85. That's irenacast.com slash 85. And for any other communication with the show in general, you can do that at irenacast.com slash feedback. And there you'll find all the ways to get a hold of us, including all of our social media platforms and email address. So without any further ado, here is this week's conversation. Hello, everyone. This is Mona from Irenacast. I have with me today a very special guest and one of my dear friends who I met in seminary, Lauren. Great to have you on, Lauren. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and contribute in any way that I can. I'm sure it will be a significant contribution as we've had many wonderful conversations through grad school. And uh, today we are talking about religious identity and in particular multiple religious identities, which may be a controversial subject for some people. So I'm really excited to talk to Lauren about this today. So would you mind telling us more about yourself? Absolutely. Um, So I... As the subject and content of this discussion alludes to, um, just a little bit about my own religious identity. Uh, I grew up with, I would say, two religious identities, Catholicism and Judaism. And this led me into a, a huge discovery process. When, and from this I studied philosophy, thinking that I could find a, a way to access both without have to without having to be in the tradition but uh, growing up in a european culture italian culture but with also a father who is from new york um, i was having all of these cultural influences that i was filtering through and seeing who i was in the midst of them uh, also, of course, comes with that language and tradition, history, and everything of that nature. Um, but I decided to try to find a way to back away from religion and approach these two traditions analytically. And I did that through philosophy. Um, but in doing so, I realized that it was incomplete, that the questions I was asking in philosophy needed the idea of God, and I had almost no choice but to go into theology with this uh, identity crisis, if you will. I understand Italy is incredibly homogenous, based on, you know, the Vatican being right there, and I spent a small amount of time during college in Umbria. Um, and got to see, uh, and it was really, um, from not growing up in such a saturated religious culture where everything is constantly reminded you of Catholicism. Um, it was really kind of uh, surprising to me to see how, um, so many traditions and shrines and, I mean, it's really a Catholic country in a lot of ways, it seems to me. Absolutely. Um, there are Jewish populations in Italy that are small, but thriving, Hard to say thriving nowadays, a little bit, with European Jewish cultures. Um, How so? I think anti-Semitism is a virus, and it's certainly not disappeared from Europe. And I think there are complicated relationships that are still present in Europe after the Shoah, the Holocaust. And many countries, many uh, Jewish communities in countries like France experience problems with this um to the experience of walking in european synagogues is definitely different from the walking into synagogues sometimes in the states especially the northeast where there's um larger jewish populations 
where the security around synagogues and Jewish schools in Europe is very, very tight. Um, and it's not feeling so safe to be there all the time. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, it's it's become a problem. Um, I mean, in France, it's become even more of a problem after after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Yeah. And actually, I, I think I understand that one of the largest immigrant populations to Israel right now is from France because the Jews there are not feeling um, that they can have a safe community. Yeah. I mean, it seems like over here we're... It's a it's a different form of anti semitism that you typically run into in the states, right? It's mm. is it is it seem different to you? I think so. Um, the history of anti semitism here doesn't have to grapple as much with the Holocaust. Mm. The Holocaust in Europe are like it's so com- it's just st- it's there. The presence of it is still there. Wow. Um, in the sense that, how can you account for? how 6 million Jews who have disappeared from the European Jewish population and who escaped to America. So if they found refuge here, it's a totally different relationship to the anti-Semitism that is still present maybe racially here in in the US, as it tends to be grouped with even racial hatred towards uh, African-Americans. It's, I think, yeah, I think there is a different quality to the anti-Semitism in the States than Europe. Yeah, and quickly, um, I know we want to get back to the question of religious identity, but if you wouldn't mind sharing with me, we had a conversation about the word Holocaust, and you actually taught me about that word and why it's problematic for some people. Mm-hmm. Would you mind sharing that for some of our listeners who don't, yeah. who might not have heard that? Sure. It's very important. Um, and unfortunately, Holocaust has been the most commonly used term. But in fact, it's a, it's a Greek word that literally means burnt offering. So it has this connotation that the Jews were actually some type of religious offering. So there are many, many populations and communities that choose not to use this word because of the connotations and choose to use the word Shoah, which in Hebrew means destruction, just tyr- like tyrannical destruction. Um, so if I use the word Shoah from now on, it is because of that of that usage but it's important to know however it's not widely known i think you know and i was i was surprised that i had never heard that before mm-hmm. and i think that speaks to how christocentric a lot of the religious connotation uh, conversations mm-hmm. are here in the states that that's not widely known that even people who study religion don't know that mm-hmm. um and how how laden with anti-semitism that word is but it's still used and i was really mortified to have learned mm-hmm. that um so When we're talking about identity crisis, um, and you're speaking about having this Catholic identity Mm. and a Jewish identity at the same time, um, if, can you help us understand a little bit more why that might be a conflict? I mean, some of things are obvious, like the, the, even the word Holocaust being widely used in Christian circles, but Mm. in Jewish circles, um, rather offensive to many people. Um, that's one example, but can you give us other examples? Sure. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of major uh, problems, problem areas in this relationship. Of course, the biggest one that has been um, the biggest problem is the relationship to Jesus or Christ in this um, religious relationship. Because at, uh, on one hand... Being Jewish uh, allows me to understand the human historical relationship that Jesus has to the Jewish traditions. And when he is speaking in the New Testament, what it is actually linking back to in the Talmud or the Tanakh or the Torah. Um, Can you quickly tell us what those mean? Oh, yeah. For those who don't know. Sure. Sure. so the Tanakh is basically the Jewish Bible, which includes the five uh, main books, the Pentateuch, and also the Proverbs and the Prophets and Song of Songs and all the other writings. Um, Ketuvim literally means writings and Nevi'im means the, prof- the prophetic writings. So it includes all of these things. The Torah is just the five books, the Pentateuch. 
um, and the Talmud is a, a, a very long and complicated book to read. It's much like playing chess with 12 other people <laughs> <laughs> because they're basically rabbis arguing with one another over the Jewish laws. Halakha means Jewish laws. So you don't just study the uh, Tanakh or the Torah. You will also, if you follow traditional Judaism, you will study the Talmud when you become a bit older and can read the philosophical and analytical writings of these rabbis throughout the centuries. Um, and, you know, rabbis from the 16th century will argue with this rabbi from the 2nd century, and it's this whole bizarre situation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I apologize, I interrupted you. So you're talking about the writings of the Tanakh and the Talmud yes, uh, in relation to the Christ and the, the Messiah, Messianic figure. Right, yeah. because of course um, Messianism is a Jewish, is a Jewish concept um, and there are many um, dimensions to that in Judaism which are not as important to Christianity, like the land of Israel, um, that the Messiah was to bring back Israel <clears throat> into its uh, into its power. This, uh, of course, did not happen with Jesus Christ, and um, many there were many possible messiahs in the Jewish tradition. But, of course, having the Catholic upbringing on my mother's side, where it's, in fact, I would say it's more, it felt more as a matriarchy at times with uh, Mother Mary having more say than Jesus. So Growing it, up in Italy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a matriarchy for sure. <laughs> but um, it's, the, the, the problem with that relationship is the most severe between Judaism and, and Christ, any form of Christianity is where does who is this man? And if you if you appreciate him and study him from a human side, can you also recognize him as something divine? Um, I, it's there's this huge huge spectrum which is not covered in most theological thought about Christ. You have him as God just God incarnate, and you have in Judaism a very good rabbi. But is there anything in between, I'm wondering, and have always wondered, is there something that can be almost negotiated theologically about him to accommodate for one's Judaism and one's Christianity if they, are, if they have both in their uh, familial heritage. How do you negotiate this? Do you have to just simply give one up and do dishonor to the other? How do you? These are the ongoing questions I've had for myself. And it sounds like the depths to which you grapple with this. It's more. It's the family her heritage, both sides, is very important. But it also sounds like for you that you both you feel an affinity um, and a, kind of a. It sounds like your belief structure is really honestly rooted in both. Mm. traditions yes and um, exactly if family heritage is a huge factor of this because for me religious identity um is a defiance of time in a way the identity links you to the past which you don't exactly know about i mean you have your past you have the past of your family and you have the past of the religious tradition all going on at the same time. You might not know the uh, past of your family completely. In fact, there may have been a lot of religious conversions you have, have no idea about. But you still feel an obligation to orient yourself to the familial past, to situate you in the present moment. But you all, it also is an orientation to the future, to say... Um, what do you expect of um, this r religious reality to bring, not just for you, but what is its sort of worldview? What is its ideas of infinity and of time? So I feel like um, there's some relationship between your immortality, if you will, and your religious identity, that it carries on beyond yourself because, well, the religion does, and so does its worldview. So the obligation to work these things out for your identity is far more than your personal 
needs. At least for me, it's something much bigger that is uh, affecting things beyond yourself. So what do you make of this? Um, besides the theological differences that you've named, mm -hmm. what do you make of this idea of communities saying that these uh, religions are just inherently mutually exclusive and can be reconciled. Mm. It seems like that comes from both sides, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> this may does. be stating the obvious, but we, you know, to the founding assumption here is <laughs> yeah. that it, it comes from both sides. Um, and maybe not for just theological reasons, but also for reasons of identity and community. Sure. Um, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes me sad inside to hear this response from both sides. However, it's become, of course, even more complicated. Now we're going back to something we discussed earlier, which was the Shoah. So this event has seriously ruptured relationships between Jews and Christians. And I don't think anything has necessarily worked itself out. Um, that's going to take a long time to heal. And although the Catholic Church, the Vatican, has extended its formal, um, how should I say, uh, apology? Apology, apology, if you will. Okay. Yeah, it feels like too weak a word. I don't even know if there's something a bit stronger. And um, with the whole Nostra Etate, which was directed to the Jews from the Vatican to apologize for the Holocaust and to apologize for all forms of anti-Semitism, which the church does not at all accept. That was recent, correct? So it was. It was um, the anniversary. Well, actually, I think it's been about 50 years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the anniversary was not so long ago. I think it was last fall. Okay. Um, so that's a formality. Um, the reality may be tending towards that positive relationship, but it's... It's relatively incomplete um, and made even more complicated with the state of Israel and what um, the opinion is on this nationalistic form of Judaism, which is Zionism. So, so many complications in the bridging of these two traditions and communities. And I, I can't say that I accept the either side um, feeling that these are mutually exclusive, but it's also for, I think, protection, pr purposes of protecting the community because there has been such harm done. Um, so I don't know what it will take to breathe, open up a little bit. And I think maybe it will help to have these individuals who have carry on both traditions. For instance, it's very interesting now because countries like Spain and Portugal are offering citizenship to people who can um, say that, uh, sorry, that's not the word, people who can prove that they have Sephardic Jewish ancestry that was originally from Spain during the 15th century before the huge expulsion the um, in the Inquisition when the Jews and the Muslims were kicked out, converted or killed, basically. Uh, so how strange is it now for this immigration policy to be in effect in Spain and in Portugal to offer citizenships to those families or individuals who can link their ancestry back to that moment in time? 500 years ago. 500 years ago. Almost. Yeah, that's really incredible. And people can do this? So it's complicated. I yeah. mean, number one, where's the paperwork coming from? Mm -hmm. So usually you can see in the immigration policy that um, they want you to show that you can maybe speak Ladino, the Jewish Spanish language, um, that you you are involved in Spanish history or, or culture. Um, but you know these individuals may very well be Catholic, and most of them are because they, their families were converted during forcibly, this time. correct? 
many times. Possibly, yes, yeah. most of the time, uh, unless they voluntarily did that to protect themselves and gain um, employment. Yeah. Um, they're called conversos in Spanish, that if you are conversos, then you you are kind of ethnically Jewish, but you're Catholic, so it's a it's a rending between the political and the religious identity that Jews uh, often maintain. It's it's a force splitting those things apart, right? Which is really sounds incredibly violent. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. a it's a rupture mm -hmm. in your I identity. Even before any other physical violence or or uh, economic violence, it's it's a psychological violence. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and and it's played out then in the 16th century, and also. In, of course, in the Shoah, when you have now um, even young people in Poland who discover that they, their um, you know, young people and older people <laughs> discover that they are Christian, but they realize that their families either gave them to Christian families to live, um, but they are Jewish, and. Even there's a there's a beautiful movie, I'm forgetting the name, of a priest, Polish priest, Catholic priest, who was given over to a Christian family when he was a little boy. Later on, after he became a priest, he discovered he was Jewish. And he's already a priest. What wow. did you do with this? <laughs> wow, yeah. He what decided to continue being a priest. And as I understand learned learned more about Judaism but did not give up his catholic identity so this identity discoveries of history that has passed is fascinating because there's you're like a your own identity is like a glacier you only know the tip of it half the time mm -hmm. and things that connect you to your present being your present moment in time are absolutely out of your sight until maybe the moment you discover it and you have to ask yourself, how do I integrate this into my religious identity? Yeah. And as you're speaking, all I can really think about, and maybe this isn't the right question to ask, I don't know, but um, it, it's just who who's to blame for this kind of thing? Is it, is, and this is a question that I've asked a lot in my studies, um, is Christianity an inherently colonial religion? Mm. I mean, we see people practicing Christianity in an intolerant way that's accepting mm -hmm. of neighbors and difference. Is it these localities such or um, political entities such as the Nazi party who adopted Christianity and used it as a mechanism for enforcement, but mm -hmm. really they had a political ideology yeah. beneath that and they were using the religion as a tool for their political gains? Um, the Inquisition is another good example of that same thing. So I... I find myself asking a lot of questions. Is it the religion itself to blame? Is it the way people practice religion mm -hmm. in such an exclusive way, the way they've interpreted it? And just saying to people like yourself, you can only pick one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we will k kind of punish you and enforce regulations on you and your person mm -hmm. and, and your identity until you pick. Mm -hmm. um, and who actually has the right to do that? Right. Exactly. Yeah, this is very challenging. Um, I'm reminded of um, I'm reminded of this book that I read maybe a couple of years ago. It's called Flatland. Do you know it? I Flatland. don't. No. It's by this author Edwin Abbott, and he actually wrote this book um, as a, a satire on the Victorian English caste social caste system, if you will. So. He, the whole book is about these different dimensions of shapes where it starts off with lines and the lines can only move in one direction. And then you have uh, a square, and then you have hexagon. It gets more complicated. And at the very top, the last dimension are circles where they can be seen from any position and they have no points or edges they are just completely revolving shapes and those are the supposed to be the sacred priests and the the most spiritual caste is the circles but if you come from the fourth or third dimension and you look down at the 
lines, you can see them clearly, but the lines do not know about the other shapes because they can only go backward or forward. Hmm. So all these casts, all these dimensions are, are separated. And it reminds me a bit ab about um, one's own identity, that you can, people can see you as a line. People can see you as only going this way or that way and totally be not knowledgeable about your other layers of identity or history or your your personal experience. Um, and they, they're, they're inaccessible to you and they force upon you certain movements that are constricting as the shapes do in the book. They demand, you know, these shapes to only make certain movements hmm. as it was in the English Victorian time. But that only applies to some people. Right, exactly. Ah, wow. So it is, I think this can be the case in certain aspects of religious tradition where it's like exploring, like say a, a Jewish person exploring Christianity it has a, a negative connotation to it. This is sad. This is constricting movement that could, in fact, expand, expand the spirituality and expand the historical relationships and to make that are not negative, because mm. there have been plenty of positive experiences. But if they're not studied and they're not embraced, how are we going to relate? Yeah, but I I love that. That's very well said. Yeah, and I know in our program you were. I, I want to say one of the only Jewish students, is that right? I think so. I think there's only one other. And, and when I met yeah. you, I thought it was tremendous that you were, you know, there with all the Protestants, um, <laughs> kicking it. Yeah. <laughs> you hey, know? I learned a lot, I can yeah. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you and I talked often, and I will completely throw myself into this category of how... Um, Interreligious literacy is just so bad, mm. even among people who study religion, mm. no, including true. myself. <laughs> and we'd had a conversation the other day about how often when interreligious services are done, it's often the Christians spearheading it because they want to seem progressive and they want to mm. branch out or, or so they think, but it's usually like done once a year and it's very tokenizing mm. as in, you know, we'll collect all our little baseball cards of the different religions and we'll have an email and a rabbi and we'll, you know, find some little poems off the internet that talk about religious diversity and then we'll send everybody home. Like we won't actually be in community with people mm. from other religions. So mm. I feel like I've learned a little bit more about that, just being around you mm. and how passionate you are about interreligious, mm. not just dialogue, because I think that kind of connotes that there's some kind of conflict right. that you have to die. You have to be constantly <laughs> talking yeah. about. It's a very serious sort of term, isn't it? It is. Um, but multiple religious exploration and celebration yeah. in a lot of ways. That's a completely different yeah. attitude. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's all coming down to as well is sharing stories um, because each religious tradition has different ways of marking time in a sense. And some events or some memories, some very important times in our history is um, far more relevant to some religions than others. So you get a whole taste, a whole different taste of the world through another person. This is fabulous. Like This is amazing that mm -hmm. you can even do this. You get this whole, like, it should be so, um, how should I say? I To experience another person talk about um, how they feel the year passing or how they celebrate these different turns of time is an incredible thing that I think is often taken for granted, like holidays per se. Let's just say that that each offers this kind of... Um, it's a different painting of the world. So if you can celebrate together, then I think you're in good relationships. If you can actually honor a time with another religion and know what does that time mean to this person i had so much fun celebrating uh rosh hashanah with you all oh, yesterday it was so fun, was so fun. <laughs> um and you might listeners be listening to the show might be released a, a few weeks later but um i i learned so much and i 
um, I realized that I had a lot of um, trepidation around <laughs> jumping into that experience. Mm. Um, I don't want to step on toes. I don't want to say or do anything inappropriate, right? <laughs> I don't want to say anything offensive. Mm. Um, and I don't want to appropriate other religious traditions for myself. So I think it seems like the the key in there is celebrating with people who really observe these religions and mm. not trying to you know, do a Christian Passover meal, maybe <laughs> like mm. go, go celebrate Passover with people who celebrate Passover. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But I see a lot of this. I see a lot of um, either sort of this uh, anxiety, I think, um, around progressive folks or um, sort of a resentment in the anti-political, co- politically correct camp that, oh, now we have to sell, we have to observe everybody's holidays. And um, mm. have you heard any of this kind of rhetoric? Like, um hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard some some negativity come out like um, around this kind of idea that these aren't the quote unquote. This is going to sound offensive, so I apologize. These, these aren't the normal holidays that we're used to, mm-hmm. and therefore we're we're going to resent that we have to be sensitive to everyone who wants to celebrate Ramadan or Rosh Hashanah mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, which uh, I think okay, is such a horribly missed opportunity, right? It is. You know, it's a difficult thing if you're in a nation that has a certain majority and where the cultural language around holidays has been towards one religion, like Christmas, like saying Merry Christmas, Happy Christmas, whoops, <laughs> <laughs> in this country. I, I can understand certain, um, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> There's an ease of communication for those who are culturally comfortable with the majority. Um, Of course, this country of many countries is constantly changing. And if it wants to uphold certain values that um, promote its diversity and equality, then you would think that there would be more room made for other holidays or greetings to to be present yeah yeah um but i I really like what you said is um is the celebratory exploratory Mm. finding the beauty in all of that diversity and learning Mm. so much i think you just the key word is beauty as you just said it is just being okay with standing silently and looking in awe and something that is completely outside of your comfort zone. And it takes a certain confidence to do that when you don't have to interject with anything of yours. You can simply look at something from a distance and um, receive whatever you can f- from it. Mm. It is a surrender in a way to be involved in another religious celebration or be invited into one it is a little bit of a surrender to your knowledge and it is more of receiving the the beauty i love that i love that so so what is religious identity to you obviously we've talked about the holidays and the observations Mm -hmm. and some of the theology but for you it sounds like this is a question you've grappled with deeply yeah I'll go back to what I was saying earlier about time, that it is an orientation to time. Mm -hmm. So when you're carrying a Jewish identity and you're carrying a Catholic identity, it comes with two uh, temporalities, if you will. What I mean by that is many things. Um, One is the role of memory in all of this the obligation to remember certain events such as the Shoah, what is it, how does it affect um, your present being? How um, Memory, I think, is a huge thing, and it can also be the memory of Jesus Christ as a human being. You don't have this physical memory, but I think a lot of religious identity forces you into this imaginary memory that you are participating in and that you're participating in with all the other members of that tradition, that you're actively remembering and um, re-experiencing that event or um, that history with your fellow 
people and that the community that you find yourself in is rooted in these series of memories or what have you. I don't think it's particularly... So it's identity is not the root of the community, I think. I think it is memory that is the root of the community. Because I feel that it is absolutely appropriate for people to have multiple identities in a religious space. But if you are actively participating in the memory which roots that tradition, then you are you are a member because you are remembering with everyone else. Hmm. I love that. And I've heard um, remembering position by some feminist theologians as re-memoring mm. is putting together what has been dismembered. Right. And yeah. reassembling that through carrying forward that memory, mm. you actually help to recreate it. And uh, there's a creative act that happens in that, mm. um, especially when it comes to uh, remembering the dismembered of uh, what has, you know, historically was what was horribly disfigured, um, and and what was what was who, what or who has been brutalized or destroyed. Mm. And of course, it's also remembering what your family has gone through because it's it's really religion is flesh as much as it is ideas. It is the experience of um, all that which brought you to your present state. So the, f the familial component is important, but hopefully not limiting. Because, of course, you have now, you know, more liberal uh, congregations of Judaism and Christianity making their religions into a very universalistic religion. And Christianity often takes that form of, a, of applying to anyone. Um, but that's challenging, I think, to, you, you can have universalistic values in all religions, which it is certainly the case, but to be participating in the tradition, I think remembering the rituals and the traditions and uh, the way time was spent in your familiar past is, uh, is very crucial, hmm. uh, even if that past is inaccessible and you later discover it. Yeah. What what of people who don't um, have a religious heritage, but they find themselves identifying with a certain uh, religion? So if they don't have the family memory component. Yeah, I, I think this is probably an important question for them to ask. Or if they are coming into a new family, then it's a more f futurely question, if you will, is how will they how will they be leading the memories for their children or grandchildren to remember the significance of this religion yeah um so there's a challenge upon them to be the leaders to create this lineage of memory yeah to to share in and tap into it's just, it's a huge it's a major source of um that tapping into that memory is it orients you i think very strongly so yeah i think it is would be there it would be a challenge in a way a good really good challenge to for them to pioneer for themselves and their families a new way of shaping religious meaning yeah. in life yeah you know i'm realizing as we're speaking that so much of my mental framework about what religion is, is centered on the question of salvation. <laughs> and of course, not every religion even cares about that question mm -hmm. <laughs> or ask that question. So true. Um, and so that, I think I would like to really pinpoint that for those of us who grew up so, you know, in, in such a insularly Christian mm -hmm. environment that mm -hmm. uh, religion can you, you can have an idea of religion that has absolutely nothing to do with what you believe about how you are saved i mean it, it could have so much more to do with your identity with um the, your ritual practice with your spirituality mm. um that this idea of who gets to even define what religion is can be religious centric to one religion mm. it's kind of mind-boggling to think about 
Yeah. So, so for you, religious identity is about memory and it's about community and belonging and family is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, I would say so. Ritual is definitely important because ritual helps to keep active the memory. Like it is, it's almost like doing scales. You are constantly tuning yourself through these rituals to be uh, not just remembering, but to be presently evoking the past into the present or perhaps the future into the present. And I think ritual is strong in both Catholicism and Judaism, and they do share parallels in that sense. Is They tend to focus a lot on the physical experience of ritual in, in the sacred setting. I never thought about comparing religious practice to musical practice Mm -hmm. and, you know, tuning your, honing your skill, your sensitivity. Mm. Um, But of course that makes total sense. And I really like that. Mm. Um, Especially because some of us in modern life have a hard time with ritual Mm. and the observance of it because um, uh, for various reasons, maybe maybe there's an assumption that spirituality ought to you ought, you ought to feel like you're being spiritual when you're religious or when you're doing a ritual, you know, or something like that. There's mm. perhaps an expectation of like a mystical component or something like that. But it, you know, ritual is simply the observance of a practice and, yeah. and, and remembering as you're saying. So, yeah, that's, it's interesting that you say that my view of ritual is that you don't have to be a hundred percent there. In fact, each time, but it requires practice because mm-hmm. if you let it go for a bit, then you have to retune yourself to, uh, it's a preparation. It's just one of the first steps. I mean, hopefully it will uh, open you up, but, um, to put all the pressure in a ritual to satisfy all spiritual needs, I think is almost impossible. I'd love to talk more about spirituality if you don't mind. Sure. What does that mean for you? What does that look like? Well, now that's a totally different question than religious identity. Um, For you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's an intertwined question with religious identity because the religion and the traditions are those reference points through which the spirit finds some type of home to dwell in and um, be able to sort of speak a language that can be recognizable. But I think spirituality for me is something very much, um, it is involved in the rituals and the traditions, but it is some type of experience happening on such a, a an acute level and silence level that it is not recognizable by anyone, but not maybe sometimes not even myself and God, if you will. It is just this silent utterance happening, not even all the time. It's, I think, a very rare occurrence. Spirituality is very rare. Religion is is much more frequent, but those spiritual moments are like... um drinking from this river that you always fail to find when you're getting lost in the woods and you only have like maybe two or three drinks like your whole life is very rare Hmm. um so that is and but everything is a preparation for that for those wow i've never thought about it that way Hmm. is uh is making yourself ready for those times when they come unexpectedly. Yes. But you know that when you experience it, then that's what it is. Like you just know it when you see it. Yes. It requires no language at all. It does not even require religious tradition, Hmm. but certainly the religious tradition can help you find your way in the woods to the river. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. So as you've experienced spirituality, in both of these traditions, has it looked different depending on the tradition? Do you, do you separate the traditions in your mind or in your um, religious space? Or is it mm. just one thing that's very blended? Mm. If for me, it is one thing. No matter if I'm in a Catholic church, receiving holy water or going up for the Eucharist, or if I'm in um, a synagogue or celebrating 
Jewish holiday, for me, it is the same. It is in the same breath. It is not, I can never separate it. I, it is theologically and conceptually, I may have separated the two from a philosophical standpoint. But in my core of cores, if you will, I cannot ever separate the two. And uh, I don't think I ever will. Because rupturing that will almost distress the spirit because it finds nourishment in both and it has no... Um, the philosophical challenge is just one piece of the puzzle and it uh, it is a good challenge and that's a never-ending one. Um, but that's not exactly spiritual nourishment necessarily. That's just... Um, that's a, a puzzle to work through and to explain to others because it's not a problem in the self. It's the explanation to other people how they can, how these two identities can correspond. That's always where the problem lies. So within yourself, this feels like a kind of a natural congruence and it, you feel like it's an external pressure to separate the two that feels unnatural to you. Yeah, that's, I would say that. I, it may be very problematic for most people to hear this. How how could it be? Um, but I have I have felt these spiritual moments in in both places. I cannot, for the dignity of my own memory, I cannot separate the two because of those experiences in both places. Mm. I I once heard a theologian say, and I. I don't remember who it is. I won't attempt to quote them, but at the very center of God and, and God might even be composed of paradox. <laughs> God is paradox. And perhaps there's something lost when we reject paradox mm. because it makes us uncomfortable, but maybe God is meant to make us uncomfortable mm. in this way. Mm. Um, it really resonates. It's, Sort of as Hegel says, it's tarrying with the negative. The, the negative is the reality. Or as Simon Weil said, the reality is a contradiction in terms. And I, I feel that strongly. Um, to dilute the paradox is almost to um, whitewash life, if you will, if you're just being as that line on the first dimension without realizing how you can actually revolve 360 degrees. Hmm. Yeah. I really, I really like that. Um, and it, it's interesting to, you know, think about what that might, might mean for somebody like me to uh, embrace other religious identities in addition to what I mm. am familiar with. Um, and maybe there are possibilities for me not to, um, not that for that not to be an encroachment, but for that to be an expression of really who I feel, what what kind of system or philosophies or religious um, traditions resonate with me on a spiritual level mm. and provide me a path to those the river and the woods. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to go back to this idea of what you mentioned before as people who have discovered different religious identities maybe later in life either because uh, they didn't realize that that actually was their family of origin or you know for a multitude of other reasons um I, I suppose you would call it conversion but maybe not maybe it's just a religious movement and we maybe the word conversion is is too stringent for that kind of a a thing. Um, conversion does imply that you're leaving something as much as you're accepting something, right? Mm. So what do you make of religious movement like this? Hmm. Um, for an individual to realize that they have been blind to a piece of their past, such as Judaism, when they're currently Catholic and they want to convert back to Judaism, I, f I find that it's not necessarily a conversion, but a, a reversion with their, uh, their turning because con conversare means to turn with, literally means to turn with, either turn with something new into a whole new place. But 
um, to reverse, to go turn again, is meaning you something in you already had that turn. You already have that turn inside. That's attunement to Judaism. You didn't know about it. So their choice to return to this lost tradition, and it really could be for, for anyone, not just these individuals who are going to Judaism. Uh, it could be in Islam. It, it could be in, in many different traditions that how powerful is the, the, the past and the keeping of the past to want to return. And this notion of return is all over Jewish theology. It's very strong and it's even stronger now um, with Zionism and this idea of returning literally to a homeland that you can become a citizen to. There's a lot of politics around this idea of return, mm -hmm. but it's also a very theological idea that you are returning to a tradition and you are returning to some type of former or futurely state that has not quite happened yet, but you are expecting it to happen, as in the, the case of Israel, where it became a country in 1948. All of the Jewish prayers, a lot of the Jewish prayers, will mention this return to the homeland. The idea of homeland is not has always not been so clear throughout history. But certainly with the establishment of Israel, it is much more clear that you can really return there and they will welcome you if you are Jewish. So it's it's fraught with so many different things happening, um, complications of like actual immigration, your theological orientation to this tradition, your familial past. Um, but... It, I think this uh, idea of return is something to, to really dwell on. And is it happening in the Christian tradition? And what is the what is the parallel yeah. in the Christian tradition? Is there a return to something? We, uh, yeah, and I'm thinking culturally. Like I'm, I struggle to really understand the idea of diaspora and what that means mm -hmm. for people in diaspora who have been scattered. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I can ever actually fully understand that. Because it's not, I, I will try my best, but it's just not my cultural heritage mm. or religious heritage. Um, but it makes sense to me that in the context of diaspora, the idea of returning and gathering is so, so important. Is so, is, is spiritually significant, mm. is religiously significant. And I, I, I also um, struggle to understand and, and, and de definitely try um, but the link between religious and ethnic heritage, again, as mm -hmm. a person was raised white and Protestant um, in the U.S., uh, neither of those things uh, really have been ingrained in me like they are for some people in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, I wanted to ask you, actually, do you think we will ever discover like a genetic link between religion and ethnicity? <laughs> you know, oh, that's very interesting. In what sense? Like, do you, do you think, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the, your family of origin and, yeah. and where, you know, the religion that your for your forebearers practiced and yeah. how significant that could be for your religious identity. Um, but I, and I wonder if there's like actual scientific or, or spiritual evidence to that or something, you know, I, I don't know if that question makes any sense. As if uh, you were to test yourself genetically for the presence of different religions yeah i don't know it's kind of a silly it's, question well, it's interesting yeah i mean this is the case in judaism you can certainly take a genetic test and mm -hmm. discover if you have any jewish genes yeah and in judaism it's it, it, as far as i understand it's the only religion that we know of or at least major religion world practice worldwide that is both an ethnicity and a, a faith right. so um right exactly which is i think one of the reasons why there's a lot of tension Mm -hmm. towards that relationship because it is the minority in the sense that it is constantly connecting back to ethnicity yeah and that it's in a sense you know modern contemporary judaism needs to redefine this relationship between ethnicity and religion when you have many interfaith 
families of a Christian mother, a Jewish father, and vice versa, whatever. Um, is it any more about being of that blood? Like how how can we expand this to living Jewishly does not just mean carrying the genes. Mm. It means something more. It means something um, much more malleable than simply identifying and that's it. Yeah, because it seems like if we're asking the question of can you have a completely blended religious identity, um, can you also be religiously identify but not ethnically identify and can you ethnically identify and not religiously identify it's but then to yeah. but then in a sense to ask that question also is to it seems like it can be seen as almost violent you know especially from the outside it seems like mm. that's not a question that um that i can really ask in a mm. way um that's very interesting um there's this french philosopher jean Emery, and he experienced the Holocaust. He experienced the Shoah. He uh, grew up like basically a a Christian. I mean, he really never uh, identified as as Jewish. He obviously was uh, in his blood somewhere. Maybe I think the Nazi rules were like, uh, I think one eighth, if you were one eighth Jewish, then you, you were counted as Jewish. I believe that was the number. But that's, you know, that's not very much, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to have experienced anything Jewish to have been counted as Jewish. So it's highly genetic in that sense, was the whole uh, extermination is uh, was a highly genetic and scientific procedure. So Shoah, uh, in a sense, maybe l- like strengthened the link between the religious and ethnic identity. I think so. Wow. I think so, because then... After he survived uh, the Shoah, Jean Amari wrote um, very much that there's now a necessity to be Jewish. Even though I was never Jewish, I would rather celebrate Christmas and talk to Jesus, Mary, Joseph. I would rather talk to them. But now, after surviving that, it's like there's a huge necessity to identify ethnically as a Jew. They reverted him. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Force, wow. Forcibly. Yeah. I, I th- this relationship is full of entanglements. Yeah. This has been an amazing conversation. Indeed. And thank you so much thank for you. being on the show. And yeah. uh really appreciate your your openness and your perspective and your wisdom. Um I learn something new every time I talk to you, actually. <laughs> literally. Likewise, let me just say. <laughs> Um, is there anything that you wish our listeners who are primarily Christian and post evangelical, most of them, some of, you know, different, different traditions, some, you know, a wide gamut of, of, of religions, of course, are represented, but mostly, um, Christians who've not had a lot of interreligious experience. Um, what would you like to say to, to our listeners? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's often the case with anyone, whatever kind of religion, who has not encountered someone of a different religion and has only read about this religion in books and creates a story about who these people are. I think no relation starts until a a meeting in the flesh, really. I don't think that a relation can start otherwise. Um. And it goes both ways, because I would also like to say that there are many Jewish communities who have never met Christians. So to bridge to bridge these two is to actually hear the story from another person. And it, it is, it's both ways. Um, I have the hope that many Jewish communities who are not as open to Christianity will let down the walls and meet and how much can be learned from these moments is incredible and not challenge your beliefs but color them color them with relationships that were previously not experienced so that that is my hope that 
meetings start in the flesh and relationships start from stories that are shared. I love that. I, that's my hope too. Yeah. And finally, what would you say to our listeners who feel that they experience uh, a multiple religious identity? Many things. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like almost like it requires um, some type of support group. You, know? <laughs> you can start one. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> um, I, I guess I just want to say, as I've said throughout, that... Um, it's the most important to feel yourself in your core, of course, regardless of how you have communicated this relationship to other people. Because I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is how you feel in yourself with all of these beautiful things that you're carrying and to actually feel that beauty, not always that tension. And tension can be there and beauty does not come without tension, mm. <laughs> but to embrace embrace that and not have to partition it in all these narrow spaces that's wonderful that's wonderful so if you're listening and you identify as a multi-religious person we would love to hear from you um, feel free to reach out and we can um, send your message along to Lauren if you have any questions or feedback we'd love to hear it we always want to be in conversation with our listeners and we really do mean it please reach out and and dialogue with us and be in community with us thank you so much Lauren for being here today and thank you. I hope to have you back on sometime soon lovely I would, I would love that indeed thank you so much excellent and for all you listening have a great and wonderful day 